very uh, can get very loud. So uh, we do keep them on mute. We really love for you to interact and um, you know share with us your comments or questions, and we try to stay very very engaged in the chat. So please um, chat away with us. We're we're happy to answer questions and forward those on to the speakers. Uh, we just had can't usually take you off of mute because there's just once we start doing that, there's a can be a lot of noise out there. Um, so be present and engaged. I think there's some great things to learn about, you know, um, and um, please mark your chat to all participants so we can all share in what you're asking. Everybody can learn from that. Sometimes the questions are really very valuable in, in fleshing details out. And we will share this information with you all after this meeting. Um, we put it up on our IPRO Learn web uh, portal as well as the network program site. So it will be available in the recorded fashion after this meeting. A next slide. So um, I'm going to check with Michelle if she's been able to. Michelle, are you good? Do we do we get your speaker in? Yes, I'm good. Um, and so I. Danielle was willing to go first if if we're still having any problems. Yes, we're in and we're good. I'll go ahead and start. All right, I'll turn it over to Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, perfect. Um, my name is Michelle and we're first going to talk about um, depression and the CMS goals and network interventions. Um, next slide, please. So this first slide shows a depression report card. Um, the report card is sent to the following people listed in the facility. Um, this example has um, the EQRS contact administrator, um, medical director, quality manager, social worker, director of operations, and the regional divisional vice president. Um, any of these contacts can be changed by changing your facility staff in our CASPIO database so you can add contacts or um, take some of these contacts out. Um, the red arrow is highlighting the CMS requirement for depression screening, which is 80% or higher. Um, next slide, please. So this red box is highlighting some resources. The first one is a tool for entering patient clinical de depression assessment in EQRS. And the second is our website that has some additional educational tools. Next slide, please. So this slide shows on the report card the date of the report, um, the number of patients screened in that box, which is 54, um, the number of patients eligible for screening, which is 72, and then the percent of screening reported rate, which is 75%. Um, so below that are the six conditions with the number of patients for each category. Um, next slide, please. So each of those six conditions are listed here. Um, so not all facilities EMR will look like this, um, but the important thing is to uh, screen the patient and document it. Next slide, please. Hey, Michelle, I just wanna stop. There's a lot of sure. people that are saying that the slides are not advancing. I see them advancing. I see a couple of people saying mine are advancing, mine are not. Um, so I don't know whether you guys could refresh your screens to see if they advance. And somebody's suggesting to go out and come back in. Um, so that that might help if you are, you know, your session isn't showing the advancements. Um, yeah, so I, I just did a lot of chat going on about um, the, uh, the slides the of slides it just it okay just, okay how it did help to log out and log back in so anyone who's still struggling with that please log out and log back in sorry michelle didn't mean to interrupt okay you, but i to make sure we could take care of that. that's okay um when you screen a patient they are either if they're positive um they need to be referred for treatment um if they're negative based on a scoring and interpretation of the specified standardized tool used and through discussion during a patient visit, the provider should determine if a patient is deemed negative. 
um, for signs of depression. So next slide, please. Um, so for follow-up, um, if you if your patient screened positive, a good follow-up plan would consist of the following. Um, additional evaluation for depression, a suicide risk assessment, um, referral to a practitioner, pharmacological intervention, other interventions, or follow-up for a diagnosis. Um, so, I mean, ultimately, if a patient is um, showing symptoms of depression or um, letting you know that they have any um, depression symptoms, then the best thing to do would be to refer for um, them to see somebody. Next slide, please. So some patients are not eligible for follow-up plans. Um, they may not be able to undergo treatment or therapy for depression. Um, some patients are not eligible for screening. Patients not eligible for screening would be patients that might refuse the screening, um, patients that are in an emergent situation, um, situations where there are certain court-appointed cases or cases of delirium, um, patients with an active diagnosis of depression or bipolar don't need to be screened. Um, next slide, please. So this is the end of the report card. It lists the UPIs for patients that have been screened. Um, please review this with your records. Um, the bottom of the report card um, where the red arrow is linked is um, the link for our help desk. In case you have any questions, you can always um, use that link there. Next slide, please. So some barriers related to treatment. Um, lack of knowledge. Uh, some patients don't know where to go to get help or how to get help. Um, and also the fear of getting help or others might know that they're asking for help. And that also goes along with stigma. Um, accessibility, there's a lack of treatment providers right now. Um, so it's difficult to get in to get appointments to see um, treatment providers. Next slide, please. So how can your facility representative help, your patient facility representative help? Um, these are some things that they can do at your facility. You can ask them to assist you in distributing um, education materials, um, ask them to develop a bulletin board to help educate patients, invite them to participate in lobby days, and invite them to your QAPI meetings to report on their progress and things that they've been doing and seeing at your facility. Um, next slide, please. Um, so before I introduce my speaker, um, do we want to do any questions or should I go on to the speaker? There, there are a couple questions here. Um, so one of the questions, I think you might have answered this, where does the follow-up plan need to be documented? Sometimes I do a follow-up, but the person still shows up on the report. Um, so in order for, like, for patients, for you to get credit for a patient that is getting treatment, it, it's done through their, um, Claims, so they have to have Medicare and they have to see um, somebody who would bill Medicare. So that's how um, we get our data is through Medicare claims data. The other question is, what if a person refuses, uh, you know, outside mental health care and they are just being followed up at the clinic? Um, what what? You know, if they decline mental health referral, how can we document that they're following up at the clinic? I would just continue to work with the patient. I know a lot of um, dialysis facilities have programs with the social workers that um, work one on one with the patients. Um, there's a lot of different programs out there that the social workers do. And I think that, you know, that's a good bridge for the patients. Um, to help them get to therapy. So, you know, working on working with them one on one and getting them to the point where, um, you know, do they need therapy from that um, sessions that you have with them is a good starting point. And I think 
we also talked about, Michelle, right, that a patient might be very depressed at the time or presenting that way because maybe they have some overwhelming concerns like they're going to lose their house or something really bad is going on. And maybe the social worker works with the patient through some of this crisis problem that's causing them to be, you know, struggling with their mental health. And if it's resolved and the patient, you know, is displaying less depression symptoms, I don't think there's any problem with reevaluating the patient and then marking them as not depressed. That would right. support the system, right? And then that would right. alleviate the need for a scheduled medical treatment per se, because um, you would have resolved it with what other situational help and support groups that you or resources that you supplied, right? Right. So that that's another venue if you're working with follow up that you might be able to um, maybe you'll resolve the issue or the patient will go on for some other kind of support that you know they're no longer in a you know a classic depressed state about. Um, let me see if there's any I think that was the two questions I saw. Oh, the the two clinics that were positive are no longer at our clinic. One had already been in and out of counseling. There isn't anything I can do about them now. So. Um, the two clients, so they should come out. I would imagine of our of our data, shouldn't they, Michelle? If they're being updated, right? Um, I don't, I will have to check with um with our data person um on that because they um they should either their treatment and their either they stay in with their treatment and their um and their diagnosis or they should be removed because they're no longer part of your census and they come out of the treatment data too so it would seem to me that they would come out the other question if you want to answer it, michelle what is a upi so in your eqrs that is the number for that identifies your patient so it's the eqrs number unique patient identifier is there anything people are asking again about if they refuse treatment um is there anything that category or place they put for refused treatment um I mean, I'm not sure how it looks in everybody, you know, in all the different facilities, medical records, um, how it looks and how it would batch over to EQRS. But I mean, I, th I think the important thing is just to continue to work with the patient. Um, you know, and approach it in different ways, talk to the patient. Somebody asked what people are using as a depression screening tool, and there's a, some answers of PHQ2 and PHQ9. I think those are the two most popular ones that the facilities use. And yes, the UPI is very similar to an MRN number, but it's just what what EQRS generates is a UPI. Cromwell, but used to, I guess, be called an MRN number. People are saying PHQ-9. Is there anything else that you know from a screening tool perspective, Michelle? Oh, I think the PHQ-2 and 9 are the most, are the two that I know the facilities use. Somebody's asking, does someone need to go into EQRS individually to update patients or is data transferred over from the applications we are using, i.e. eCube and Care Team Hub? Most facilities have like a batch over, and then usually they have somebody go in and double check. Oh, just kind of like cross check that everything was batched over correctly. Yeah, because most of them will pick up fields and, and be able to track that. Although we've found that there's some fields that are in EQRS that we don't know where they match in the medical record, right, Michelle, with these yes. categories. Somebody asked, so if a patient is positive and um, they go seek other help, um, that's not counted. Uh, but oh, but the provide, but the, but it's a provider that doesn't bill Medicare, then they will not show up as having follow up plans. And they said that could be missing a lot of data. So um, that's true. I mean, it is correct. It is a it is a barrier we have. 
So that is that would be somebody who goes for private pay treatment or therapy? Is that what that would be? And I don't know which group that would be. Yeah, I guess it could be something like that or somebody that goes to see like a pastor or something that, you know, someone that they, they could get therapy from that wouldn't be billing. Oh boy, there's just a ton of questions here. What are the parameters to be included in this report? Is this is it that their census or report is run based on admit date? Sometimes they show as not assessed when they were just admitted. Um, so I think you know it, it does catch people right away, right? The report and it's going to show them as not assessed until you catch them up at your facility. Now that might mean that you still have the three months to get them assessed, or maybe the person isn't due until October and we're showing them as not assessed. Um, it, but you, you know, you have your like your timing to wrap that up. So I think we just have information. We don't have the dates of the assessment. We just have information about being assessed or not assessed. And that's why they might appear on that report as not assessed yet. And, as long as you get them done in the t in the time frame of that year, what's applicable for your screening, then it's going to be fine. How do you find the who the UPI belongs to? I think that's an EQRS probably help list, right? To find the is that something Svetlana? I see you on. Could you attach an EQRS um, link that they to show them how to look up a UPI? Having uh, the patient sign the release specifically for mental health is a challenge. They may claim they are following through with the provider they referred to, to, but unless they sign that release, you cannot verify. Um, and she's another person asked, can you save the tools again? But that will be in what we send out, right, Michelle? Yes. Oh, this is a big area. If the patient's already diagnosed of depression, do you still need to do this on? I don't know what that question means. Uh, and then someone else is asking if they do the PHQ-9 first or just do the PHQ-2 first, and if it's positive, go to the 9. We've mostly heard that they do the 2 first, right? And then go to the 9? Yes. Okay, there's another person asking for the meta, for the UPI number, how to find it. And there's some trouble with sound. Are you all hearing me okay? Is anyone else having trouble? Sound is clear. All right. Well, I think we want to um PCP can be the help for the patient and may not count with the Medicare either. Um and I, I we agree that if somebody can Help the person overcome their depression. You could rescreen and, you know, put them now as not depressed. So that's a, that's an intervention you can do and, and update their status. Yeah. Uh, see, there people are talking about how some of the symptoms of depression are similar to starting dialysis. Um, I said Lana is making the point that the screening is due annually from their admission date. Um. Ah, oh, wow, I just a ton of, and, and so Lana's looking up the help tool for the UPI. Um, all yeah. right, well, PIs and the links are included in the report, and they're asking to share the link. Um, Michelle, I guess you're, you, some, there's a little bit it's of sound. Me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I know you're battling a cold, so I know you're. In my voice. Talking. Project as high as you can. So, yeah, please, you know, we'll try to answer any questions we missed. There was a lot, a of, lot of discussion. Really great. We really appreciate that. Um, there was a lot going on in the chat, and I think we got to most of the common themes. Um, but now we'd like to introduce Michelle's guest speaker. Yes, I'd like to introduce Sherry Shively. Um, she is a patient facility representative at U.S. Renal Care North Haven. Um, she's going to talk about some things that um, she does at her facility. Um, so, Sherry. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, our facility is 
in, as she said, North Haven, Connecticut. And I have been at that clinic for three years now. I just celebrated my third anniversary in January. Um, and, oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I've, I've seen that picture and it still really blows me away every time I see it. Um, I told Michelle, that is me, 84 pounds lighter. That is the most recent picture of me. Um, I was trying to get on the transplant list and was denied because of my weight. And then I got put in a nursing home and... Um, that nursing home helped me to gain an additional 20 pounds in a week uh, based on what they were feeding me. And since July of 2021, I have lost 84 pounds, um, which is really, for me, a remarkable thing because I have been overweight and morbidly obese since high school. So it's pretty major. Um, but anyway, back to what I was talking about. I am the PFR, and I took over after a really, uh, really nice gentleman who didn't really want to be PFR anymore. He was kind of tired. And so I said, yeah, I'll do it. My husband also was an ESRD patient. And um, he passed away in 2016. He was blind um, because of diabetes. And so he and I shared a lot of the exact same medical ailments, except mine were far less advanced than his. Um, we used to be advocates for both the national kidney and american kidney and we would speak and we would do um, info tables at his college because he did go to college and he got his associate's degree um, we went together and i was his i am deaf um, in 2011 i went to bed one night when i woke up i was deaf on one side and had profound hearing loss on the other and so I, in my time, have had lots of opportunities to experience and deal with depression. And I have experienced and dealt with depression. Um, and it's not easy. And going into dialysis, even knowing everything that I already knew, um, because of being my husband's caregiver and his... A family member, I have a really unique perspective. So I've got myself as a patient and I can deal with things as a patient and I can deal with things as a, I have a two-year-old grandson that lives here in the house with me. So if you hear him, I'm sorry. Um, but I have the ability to relate to the patients that are in our yeah. clinic um, on several different levels and for their family members and their caregivers. So I feel like I've been placed in a really good place um, and can help people deal with the things that they need to deal with. And I have helped patients who are brand new in our clinic to be able to talk about the things that they're feeling. Um, I'm able to go in and say to the people especially on my shift. My shift is, is really, um, I'm in the first shift and we, we talk a lot. Um, but it allows me to be able to say to them, how did you feel when you first became a patient? What are some things that, that you remember when you first were told that you had to have dialysis? And, and the feelings range, everything from I was okay with it to I was devastated. And and to be able to have the kind of relationship with the patients where I can actually say, okay, so how do you feel now? Or is there anything else that we can do 
together or I can help you find information for or whatever. Um, because of my background, I have the ability to do that. I also was a caseworker for 17 years with the American Red Cross. And so I know how to look for community resources and I know what resources are really, really good ones and one, some that are not always supreme or sublime, whatever you want to say, but I do know how to find them and I can usually direct people to them. So in our clinic, I'm able to function as the PFR who can talk to your family member, talk to you, talk to your caregiver and try and take all of those things and put them together and make something that works for you. Um, we have, we celebrate um, March as Kidney Month and we celebrate World Kidney Day in our clinic because I want to and I feel like it's really important. It's important for everybody to know what is going on in Kidney World and to try and and bring to them the information that's going to help them the most. And so I try really hard to do something along those lines every March. I mean, I try during the year too, but March, I really, I, I make orange ribbons and we wear the ribbons. And, and um, this year we gave out uh, bracelets that said um, hope, and faith and um, survivor. And everybody got a bracelet. Last year it was my cousin painted for me special rocks and everybody got a rock with their name on it and it had an inspirational saying. So I, we try to do things that are fun and happy and don't look at all the sad things that can accompany dialysis and accompany kidney disease. And I try to, within the community, the regular community, um, get the word out so that people do know and people have the ability to go to their doctor and say, test me for kidney disease because I need it. Um, because people, people need to know. And unfortunately, kidney disease is, is you know, it just kind of creeps up on you. And by the time it gets to you and you're diagnosed, it's usually kind of too late and you're headed for the dialysis chair. And I was blessed because I knew that I had kidney disease and I knew where I was on the on the spectrum and I knew how to hopefully hold back. But in January of 2020, due to um, lack of testing while I was on a diuretic, um, my kidneys failed because I had no potassium left. And um, I got to the emergency room just in time. Had I been a day later, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you. Um, but I am and I can and I intend to let people use me for the knowledge that I've got because that's what I'm here for. And that's what I want to be here for. I want to be able to share what I know and share it with whoever will listen to it. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot. I've, I've been through a lot in my lifetime and I've, I, when they asked me if I would be comfortable talking about depression, I was like, yes, because I, I battle depression and it's okay. And it, and it's okay to admit it. And unfortunately there are far too many people who are afraid to say, I'm depressed. I need help because there's such a stigma and, and it doesn't need to be that way. And I think we all as a population need to really look at that and really need to help people that are in that boat be able to ask for help and not feel embarrassed or 
or upset or like they're less than um, because I, I've been all of those things. And I remember very distinctly the very first time I got diagnosed with depression, I would not, I flat out refused to take any kind of medicine because I have always been taught that I'm a strong person. And I found out that I wasn't. And it's okay not to be strong and it's okay to say so. But the people around you need to, when I say the people around you, the people in the clinic or, or your peers or whatever need to be there to help you and, and encourage. I think that's the biggest thing is encourage. Um, had there been people there who would encourage me way back in the very beginning, I probably would have taken that and ran with it at that point in my life. Um, I had two children. We had just moved from South Carolina, sunny South Carolina, back to Connecticut, where I first experienced the um, the the real fall that I hadn't seen in eons because I was raised up here um, and dealt with seasonal depression. That was where it all started. And I'd never heard of it before. And so I just thought I was, I thought I was missing South Carolina is what I thought it was. And that's not what it was. I had two little children and my husband went off to Korea um, as military and we were military family and and the next thing I knew, I was at Fort Drum, New York, which is, if any of you know, upstate New York in the middle of nowhere. And it's very small. And I spent a good deal of time indoors. And that was not like me. And so I had a hard time. But I can't say I'm better now because I'm never going to be 100% better. But I can handle it now, which I couldn't do before. And I know to ask when things start to get bad. I know that it's time to say something. Um, and and that is a major thing. So. Hey, Sherry, Sherry. I'm going to yes. have them go to the next slide so we can um, show okay. some of the things you've done. Okay. Um. You want to tell them about this? Uh, as you can see, I'm the PFR, and that's my picture again. <laughs> Lisa, our, our social worker, just took that picture and ran with it, um, which is okay. Like I said, I'm, I'm kind of proud of it. I'm 62 now. I'm a widow, and I have 15 grandchildren, and they're all unique every single one of them and i have some that are adhd and i have some that are that are battling depression just like me um but so so that picture just signifies a lot of things to me now um we do a newsletter every month uh that goes out to all of our patients in all of the um You have to forgive me. Sometimes I just get stuck. Um, all of the clinics, all of the different time slots for the clinics. Um, and it usually includes, it includes this regular newsletter and then information things. Um, I think we just got one today that dealt with um, access and how to care for your access. So things like that. And we, at holiday time, she a lot of times includes a a crossword puzzle or a word search to go along with everything else we've got for information. Um, this one was fall prevention and um, making dialysis more enjoyable. We now have crossword puzzle books out in the lobby. And like at Christmas time, we did a, a, a memory tree. Um, where you could take and write somebody's name on a little ornament, and it was a little miniature tabletop tree, and we had, we were able to put our people's names on them, and it was people that we had lost from the clinic, as well as family members or whomever. Um, but it, it's things like that that 
that add to the clinic and add to everybody being because we are like a family. We are just it's another whole family. Um, but and we have a another clinic in orange and I think you have. Yeah, can you go to the next slide Daryl. Stephanie? I think this is the next one has their newsletter. Go yes. ahead, Sherry. And that is that is their PFR. Um, and I just had a momentary lapse in my head. I know his name and I know him. And Ralph. Yeah, yeah that's Ralph. Ralph, thank you. Um, I have a disability and part of my disability is sometimes I get stuck. And I'll be talking and I just kind of stop and it's because it won't come out of my mouth. So, and again, we're, we're talking about depression. Um, he also is an active PFR orange and North Haven have active PFRs and, and we very much want to be part of our, our fellow family members. Um, lives and and for them to know that we are available and, and we can help. Um, yeah, and um, Sherry, I want to show some of the things you've done with um, Lisa. I think the next slide. Our depression yeah. board, yes. Um, we do, we have one bulletin board that we change out monthly and that monthly changes to a different topic. So this, uh, this one was on depression and she and I try to get together and figure out what the following month is going to be. And then we work together to see what we can find that will be, um, We'll we'll put the information across, but also draw enough attention because very often you put up a board and people just like walk by it and nobody looks at it. So we want to try to draw attention to it. And again, that's that's where I also have an edge in being in the clinic, you know, three days a week. I can say, hey, did you see or did you know or whatever? And then people will stop and take a look. Um, we have that board and we have a birthday board. So we all know when everybody's birthday is and and can share that also. But we've done, we do every March, we do one for kidney month and World Kidney Day. Um, we've done them depression, we've done anger, we've done um, depression, anger. Uh, next month is organ donation month and so we'll be doing one for organ donation so that we can kind of just bring to light the things that are important okay next slide uh, yes those are affirmation cards and sometimes with the newsletter she will include lisa will include um, things like the affirmation cards or things to just make you smile, you know. Um, sometimes they're stickers, sometimes they're these, but but things that that help you to to see the the light at the end of the tunnel that isn't always a train. And those are the stickers. Those were the ones that she did for Mental Health Awareness Month. And this this year, uh, May, I believe, is is Mental Health Awareness Month. And we're going to do um, somebody. I I have a friend who's agreed to donate. Um, they're like miniature stress balls, so everybody in the clinic will get a miniature stress ball, so they can they can relieve some of their stress. And I try also to include not just the patients, but also the staff, because they're such an important part of our lives. 
you know, to, to I try very hard. Uh, Christmas time, I did stockings for everybody, all of the staff and all of the patients and included a special little treat in each of those. So, and everybody's has their name on it because it just is more personal that way. But yeah. Okay. Any questions for Sherry? Um... Sherry, how do you find time to collaborate with the social worker? You're, are you still on dialysis? I am, and she sees me at least once every time I'm there. And, and then there's the times when I just yell, Lisa, and she's on the other side of the room and she heads over toward me. Um, or I call her or we email back and forth. So that's not usually an issue. Hey, we got a comment. They love the memory tree. Yeah, you... I, I've always liked the memory tree. My, um, we did that. The first time I ever did that was at my husband's dialysis in San Antonio is the first time that I've, I did that. And then I did it here this year. I talked with Lisa and we decided to go ahead and do it. And people were very open and very receptive to it. So I think we'll probably continue doing that. And you do the bulletin boards with Lisa, right? I help, I help her with, yeah. Um, I help her with whatever she, she, she usually comes and we talk about it. Like next month is, is, as I said, organ donation month and I'll contribute whatever I can to help her. And same with her, with me, and then we'll put up the board and make it beautiful and make people want to read it. That's a nice work, yeah. Sherry. Many great ideas. Um, I think love... that's a, a big part of being a PFR is actually working with the people in the clinic. Because they need to know what I've got to say, and I need to know what they've got to say. So that I can bring back to the, the patients that are in the clinic, what everybody's thinking and our staff will understand where we're at. I'm going to read this 1 last question and then I think we need to go to the next um, speaker. Um, they said, Sherry, thank you so much for speaking and sharing your story. Um, these are all amazing ideas. We want to start a peer support group at our clinic for encouragement. Do you have any tips or recommendations on how we can be successful? Everybody needs to listen to everybody. And there are no, there are no ideas that are not good ideas. You need to really listen and try to expand on whatever your, your PFR or whomever is talking about and try to find positive ways to to work things. Um, I think the most important thing is positive spins on things. Um, try to try to take if somebody's got a, an idea and really, really wants to pursue the idea, give them the, the support that they need and try to do whatever it is they're looking at doing. And if it's not possible, then you'll know you'll know early enough on um, if it's really not possible, but but if you try hard enough, it's it's easy to find things and work at things together. But you got to do it together. Thank you so much, Sherry, for taking the time to be on our call. No problem. Y'all have a blessed day. Hi everyone, I'm Danielle Andrews and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about health equity. Next slide. So what is health equity? According to the World Health Organization, health inequity are systemic differences in healthcare outcomes. Equity is the absence of unfair, avoidable, remedial differences among groups of people, whether those groups are defined socially, economically, demographically, or geographically, or by other dimensions of equality. Health equity is achieved when everyone can attain their full potential for health and well being. Next slide. 
So what are some health equity barriers? And as the network, we've identified unstable housing, racial and discriminatory practices, a lack of medical access, health literacy, insufficient insurance policies, language barriers, consistent transportation, access to renal friendly foods, and income inequality as different barriers to health equity. So next slide. So some of our initial health equity interventions included, we focused in on transportation. And as we've heard from different patients in different facilities, that transportation remains as one of the big barriers to compliance in dialysis. So with that, we looked for ways that we can improve, improve accessibility to transport, transportation. And that included utilizing something like Uber Health, which is a HIPAA compliant technology solution for healthcare organizations that leverages the ride hailing power of the Uber platform. So essentially it is a collaboration between the healthcare organizations and Uber to create accessible and low cost transportation for patients going to different medical appointments. And it's just a way to help ensure that patients have consistent transportation. Um, in terms of telehealth, we are also focusing in on the insurance wireless phone plan, which essentially if you qualify for SNAP or qualify for Medicaid, you would qualify for the Federal Lifeline Assistant Program, which provides free monthly data, unlimited testing, and a free smartphone. Um, also in accordance with telehealth, we also focused in on the Affordable Connectivity Program, which is an FCC benefit program that helps ensure that households can afford the broadband they need for work, school, healthcare, and more. Um, you can get discounted up to $30 per month, or you can also get free um, broadband internet if you qualify financially. Next slide. So another thing that we noticed was accessibility. And a lot of times people have said that they utilize the emergency room in the hospitals because it is a place where they can get all of the treatments that they need. So we have identified the health, the HRSA Health Center program, which highlights community-based and patient-directed organizations that are focused in on providing comprehensive, culturally competent, and high quality pri primary care services on an integrated level um, throughout different states. So if you actually click the link for the Find a Healthcare tool, it should provide you with federally funded integrated healthcare settings within the state within a 250 mile um, area of you. And it can be selected on patients' language preferences, on patients' insurance preferences, and these organizations tend to cover um, people with limited health insurance, and they tend to also cover undocumented immigrants. Next slide. So in terms of our health equity um, guest speaker, I wanted to kind of go over some of the demographic and social factors that predict the likelihood of receiving a kidney transplant. So these are some of the factors that have been associated with lower probabilities of of receiving a kidney transplant. So that includes being of African descent, being of an older age, having lower income, having public insurance, having comorbidities, having a greater reliance on religion, less social supports, less knowledge on transplants, and fewer learning activities. So next slide. So now with that said, I would like to introduce Tara Fulgram from Fresenius Medical Care Kenmore to discuss um, decreasing health barriers to transplant. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, it is certainly a pleasure to be on this platform and I'd like to thank Danielle um, for um, inviting me and also Barbara Breckenridge for um, recommending me. Um, just recently, there was an article put out about our work with Dr. Kaler, who is the transplant surgeon at ECMC. And I just wanted to um, quote this. It says in here that black, Af black Americans are more than three times as likely as non-black persons to experience kidney failure, but 25% less likely to undergo a transplant the result of a combination of social and economic disparities, which goes along with what Danielle has just um, presented for us. So um, 
um, in talking with Danielle, she um, helped me develop some slides. So next slide, Danielle. Um, so at Fresenius, um, transplant is a huge deal, as you know, with the changes and requirements from um, CMS, um, transplant is paramount. So within the first 30 days of an admission, um, we talk with the patient and find out if they are interested in transplant. Um, and that is document on, documented with a transplant assessment. Um, and, and with that, we're to find out, you know, if they are currently interested, if they um, had already been self-referred or referred by a, their physician, um, and where they are in that process. Um, so we dive deep. I mean, we find out, you know, the date that they were referred, how they were referred, um, if they had their first appointment, um, if they missed their first appointment, why did they miss their first appointment? And all of this is documented on the transplant assessment. Next slide. Um, so um, after we find out um, the information about, you know, whether they're interested, um, then we go into the referral stage. Um, so we find out, um, you know, what information is still needed by the transplant center. Um, for us, when we're doing a referral, we have what's called a transition report, which generally has their dialysis prescription, their labs, their um, flow sheets. Um, it includes the 2728. Um, insurance uh, cards, um, uh, vaccination records, um, any x-rays or anything that they've had, um, history and physical within the last 12 months, um, things of that nature. And then we fax all that over to the transplant center. Next slide. Okay, so um, in terms of education, this occurs simultaneously with the referral process. Um, you know, depending on if the person is totally new to dialysis um, or a transfer in or have been on dialysis for a while, everybody gets educated on transplant. Um, and even if they decide they, um, you know, they don't know where they are in the process, what we then do is um, a readiness assessment. And that's documented as well. We use a readiness ruler um, and we use the stages of change to assess if someone is in the pre-contemplation stage or early contemplation or the contemplation stage or actually in the preparation or action stage. Um, so all of that is documented. Um, and usually um, it's revisited every three months. Um, you know, unless the person has, you know, adamantly said, you know, I'm, I'm totally not interested, you know, so then we do it on an annual basis, but pretty much every three months, it's, you have to document on the assessment what their transplant status is. Um, so in our education, we have lots of education um, to give patients. There's booklets, there's a pamphlet, there's um, what we call, um, uh, the um, getting a, a kidney transplant, what to expect, um, you know, what you want to know. Um, and then, let me see, this is like about 16 pages of information. Like there's resources, there's um, online resources. We have an online community at Fresenius and you can go to fresenius.kidneycare.com slash community. Lots of information. We have what we give out, it's called um, like pathway to transplant. And that basically is a sheet where you can document um, the date and time of your appointments. Um, those appointments could include um, your EKG, your chest X-ray, blood work, echocardiogram, stress test, colonoscopy if you're over 50, pap smear for the females, mammogram uh, for females over 40, and any other uh, appointments that you have. So it's giving you um, pretty much a comprehensive list and expectation of what, you know, what you'll have to go through um, throughout the testing stage and the um, 
transplant process. Um, next slide. Um, okay, so with transplant, there is continuous follow up. Um, it, there's continuous follow up. There are many, many barriers to uh, people completing their um, transplant evaluation process. Um, anything from, you know, unstable housing um, to lack of social support um, to, you know, um, you know, patients feeling like they're being screened out uh, rather than screening in. I know one of the things Danielle wanted me to um, talk about specifically was um, ba the barriers. And so what we've done, not only am I a dialysis social worker, but I'm also a community advisory board member um, for um, Kidney Health Together, which is a community board put together um, by Dr. Kaler, who is the surgeon at ECMC uh, Transplant Center. Uh, and so I have a direct connect with Dr. Kaler and have been successful with um, kind of not so much cutting out the middleman, but in essentially, you know, if uh, I had two cases where the transplant center, you know, told these individuals they couldn't progress to through the evaluation stage because of certain situations. And so because of my relationship with Dr. Kaler, I was able to, thanks, Danielle, I was able to um, talk with her and explain the extenua extenuating circumstances. Um, in one particular situation, um, the patient was denied because uh, they had been living with a family member, but because um, of, you know, the family members saying that this person needed to get their own place. Um, they did eventually get their own apartment and had been maintain, maintaining in their own apartment for months. And so um, I had to go back to Dr. Kaler and say, hey, uh, the, the transplant team decided he wasn't appropriate. However, at this point, he is living on his own and he's been successful for many, many months. And so we need to reevaluate this person. And the person, um, she intervened and the person was transplanted. I had another situation where this woman who was living in a homeless shelter was um, had been in the homeless shelter for over a year. She um, had been approved for a Section 8, and she was just waiting to find an apartment. And so because she was still in the shelter, the transplant center said, you know, you don't have stable housing and we're, we're not going to advance you toward, you know, um, listing you. And so there was another incident where I, you know, went directly to Dr. Kaler. This person has a backup plan. They have a mom, they have a brother. If in fact she is called for a transplant, she has a place to be discharged too. And the fact that she was so close to getting an apartment, Dr. Kayla intervened and that person was transplanted as well, have not seen them since. So I'm um, assuming that they're doing well. Um, so yeah, just having that relationship directly with the surgeon and her being able to go back to her team and say, hey, let's take a second look at these folks we've been able to successfully get people transplanted. So that is a best practice and it certainly has worked for um, the uh, patients that um, have come across, you know, that difficulty. Let's see. Yeah, so I think that was the best practice though. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Hi. Thank you so much, Tara. So I do see one question in here. It says, do you have a transplant assessment form that you use? A transplant assessment form. It is in our, um, it's in our system. Like it's a part of, um, what do you call it? <laughs> our, it's integrated in our workflow. So it's a percent, it's in a Fresenia system. I don't know how to say it. EQ. <laughs> EQRS? No, EQ, our EQ okay. clinicals. So EQ clinicals. It is in our, we call it EQ clinicals. So okay. the assessment is embedded into our workflow and like the EQ clinical system. It's a Fresenia system. So it's only for Fresenia usage, Ooh. the transplant assessment form. That we use, yes. Okay. 
Um, we see a lot of great work um, that they're glad that these patients had you to advocate for them. Um, yeah, are there any other questions? Let's see. Okay, so it's one question is how do you overcome the long wait list? I find so many patients help the client over time and they are deemed ineligible. That that is the worst part about it because um a lot of people, you know, expire waiting on the um, you know, the donor list. So what I would suggest is that they look for a live donor um and they advocate, you know, for themselves um in terms of finding um a you know if they can find a live donor you know just advertising you know through facebook through social media um being your own best advocate um instead of waiting on you know um a donated kidney but to find a a, a live donor um is 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 what i would suggest um that essentially cuts the wait time if you could find a live donor and going to going to the social media outlets letting family and friends know letting people you know if you're part of a religious community your church or whomever um you know doing you know different maybe um you know we had some patients here who did um fundraisers for if you, if you once you get um eligible to be listed maybe doing a fundraiser that drums up you know um awareness that you need a donor um, but using social media outlets, you reach a you know a lot of people. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for presenting today. You're welcome. Any thank you. last questions before we end the presentation, or any last remarks from anyone on the QI team? Uh, Oh, someone let us know that there is an organization called Dove Transplant that helps veterans who are who are active on a transplant list find live donors. Somebody asked Sherry before, I think if we could take one more question for Sherry, the patient uh, facility rep, um, how long or how much time she puts into doing this work at the facility. Is Sherry still on, Michelle? Let's see if she's still on. I love I love the living donor um, piece. I think that is so important. We've really uh, seen a, a, a lowering in living donation after the pandemic and Everybody is trying to work on that now. I know there's a, a lot of work being done legis legislatively to protect living donors um, in different states uh, so that, you know, it, it, there's not problems with access to insurance and there's paid time off and things of that nature. So really, I uh, loved your idea of, you know, how do you get off the wait list sooner and, and looking for living donation and telling your story. Thanks for encouraging that approach. You sure you're still on, Michelle, or no? No, she's not. Okay. Um, what is your suggestion for many of us to develop a more of a relationship with transplant surgeons? I love how you're able to directly connect with the surgeon. Uh, I guess that's a question for Tara. Uh, okay, so what was the last part of the question? They, they loved how you could directly connect with a surgeon and, and they don't know how you were able to set up that relationship, Tara. Oh, because of the community advisory board. Um, ah. Yeah, so um, I sent Danielle an article explaining that I don't know if, if you can send this out to people, Danielle, but I emailed it to you. I don't know if you, you got it. I can I can send it out to whoever wants the article. Okay, so it, put the, the link in chat if you have it, Danielle. Yeah, there, there was an article that came out March 19th. It was about the community advisory board, but what I would say is. Oh. Um, if you have an opportunity to meet your transplant team in your area, uh, make it a, a, um, a goal to um, schedule a meeting to visit the center. One of the things Dr. Kaler did is she invited the community advisory board to come up to the transplant center and meet the staff. 
and you begin to develop, you know, personal relationships with these people. And and just recently, last week, as a matter of fact, they had an education program um, where Dr. Kaler brought in a speaker. And so going to, you know, those education events, if you have them in your area um, that are sponsored by, you know, a transplant um, department, um, any education, or even inviting them to come to the facility. And I don't know if, you know, people still have a moratorium on, you know, visiting the facility, but have, have you know, the staff, the transplant staff, maybe do a lobby day, you know, just it's, it's really is relationship building and developing and then you find out who 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 the surgeon is um and you can get their email address i've emailed dr kaler several times um you know just um really developing those relationships and getting to putting a face with a name um i had one of the uh the, the ladies come up to me at the education she's like oh my god it's finally you know it's nice to finally put a face with the name like we talk over the phone all the time so yeah it, it really is relationship development The people are asking for the article. I don't see any more questions, Danielle. Um, but I'd like to remind everybody we do have a survey that should pop up after we close the uh, best practices call today. And I want to thank everybody who um, presented for us. Tara, Sherry, I know she's off, but there were so many great comments. M Michelle, maybe you could follow up and send her that chat feed because she really does an amazing job at um, at her clinic. And and everyone was really um, happy that she shared and and the support she gave and Tara you have wonderful ideas to overcome health equity and thank you for sharing those it it, it your kind of stickiness to the uh transplant issue and transplant problems and overcoming barriers is is what we need it's so wonderful to hear the work that you've done and how you've been able to help people get a transplant so um we always appreciate and thank the community for being involved and want to um thank you all for i hope you were able to walk away with some good tips or things to energize you as we go forward in the work and um have a great day and please be sure to fill out our survey when we uh, when you log off thank you so much thank you take care